Father, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and for your kindness that you showed to us. Lord, for your unfailing mercy and grace. Lord, we, uh, we would be uh, out in the streets. We would be away from one another. We would be out as a wayward child or as a prodigal son apart from your grace. And so, Lord, we thank you for your kindness to us. Lord, um, we pray that you would forgive us, that you would wash us clean from our many sins, for our failures. And Lord, that you would draw us back to you, draw us close to you. Um, Lord, we lift up each need in our prayer list to you. We pray, Lord, that you would work in each person's life according to your will and in your way. Lord, uh, we pray for our Bible study tonight. Lord, we just pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, that, uh, that through your word we would be encouraged. Lord, we know that these things um, were not just written for first century Jews and first century Christians, and they weren't just written for the, the very last generation that will be alive on the earth at the end, but they were written for all of us that we might find hope and encouragement. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to find that tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I promise I will not be long tonight. Um, but you know what the joke is? They say that a, a, a preacher's uh, one more minute is really like 15 minutes, right? So, um, but we're going to be uh, back in Revelation, in Revelation chapter 20. Um, my plan is to finish chapter 20 tonight. And um, for us to hopefully finish the book of Revelation before the end of the month. So a couple more weeks and, uh, and we'll be done. Um, now I told you uh, a few weeks ago when we started chapter 20 that my particular understanding of this chapter and of this 1,000 years that we talked about is, is that it's a figurative number implying a long period of time. And the binding of Satan was a reference to uh, a binding of his work that uh, he wasn't going to be able to come against the church and the gospel in a, in a way that hinders the church and the gospel from going to the nations. That the binding of Satan is similar to that of what Jesus talks about, the binding of the strong man in his instructions on casting out demons. And we have to remember when we read the Bible, especially in the New Testament, there is a already not yet aspect to the New Testament. Right? There is something that we see in the New Testament, for example, the kingdom of God is already here, but it's not yet in its fullness. It's already, but not yet. Jesus said, when he came preaching, he said, the kingdom of God is at hand, right? And then later he told the disciples that the kingdom of God was within them, right? So the kingdom of God is here, but we're still awaiting for the full consummation of the kingdom when Christ returns. It's already, but not yet. The same is true about Satan. Satan is already defeated. He's already been beaten by Christ at the cross. He is a defeated enemy, yet he is still a present enemy. So he's already defeated, but not yet. Right? So there's an already not yet aspect to Satan. He's already defeated, but he hasn't been vanquished from the earth yet. We're awaiting for Christ to come and do that. And the timeline, if you want one, for Revelation 20 and really for the whole end times, this is what we have. We have Jesus rises from the dead, and He ascends up to heaven. The Holy Spirit is given at Pentecost, and the church is born. And Peter says that is the beginning of the last days. During that time, the devil is bound up so that he can't prevent the church from going to the nations. Now, that doesn't mean the devil isn't out tempting people. He's not out destroying lives. He is doing all of those things. But Satan is hindered in his ability to stop the gospel from spreading to the nations. And so, all of the nations will ultimately hear the gospel. And people from every nation and tribe and tongue will come to Christ. And when that happens, Satan will be unbound. He'll be released from how God is keeping him from deceiving the nations. And he will again go and do that work and turn all of the nations against the people of God. Some folks would hold to um, a literal seven-year tribulation, and that would be fit into that period. They would, this would be the appearance of the, of the final Antichrist. If you remember, there will be many Antichrists, but there will be one particular last Antichrist who will come and he will oppose uh, all of the things that, is, that are Christ. And then the nations will conspire together under the head of the Antichrist, Satan's man, to destroy the people of God. And it's in that moment, Revelation 20, we'll see in just a minute, tells us that Christ will return. That that will be the return of Christ. And so 
With that being said, we're going to read Revelation 20. We're going to read verses 7 through 15. And this is that last part. So what we're about to read is the nations have now heard the gospel. All of the nations have, have people in them that are saved. And Satan has been unbound. So verse 7. When a thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. And first came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and, the de and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. <clears throat> now, of course... I told you this is a, the, towards the end of the timeline, right? But this isn't John being transported through time to see some future event. He's receiving a vision. And so the picture here is not necessarily about a literal nation, um, but it is about the devil bringing the people of the world to fight against the church and against the gospel. And so first we see the deceiving devil in verse 7. When a thousand years are expired, Satan is loosed out of his prison. He's loosed from whatever is keeping him from deceiving the nations. And he goes about doing that again. And he's going to be particularly ruthless because his time is short. And he knows his time is running out, especially when that comes. To which we should not look with a growing pessimism in the future. Even as the culture and the world around us grows darker, we need to understand that the gospel will advance, that Christ will be victorious. And so we should have an optimistic view of the future. And so number one in the notes is this. The gospel will advance for a long time, unstopped. It will advance. Satan's advancing is a short time. It's only a small mark on the radar. And so we should look with hope and anticipation for what God is doing in the world. Right? Never think that missions is a waste. In fact, as the day gets closer, we should be more mission-minded. We should be more giving towards mission, more willing to share the gospel and to stand on the gospel. As cultures change and forsake the church, we must be more bold in our witness because the gospel will advance. And that should be an encouraging thought for us. But there will be a time when Satan is finally unleashed, where we... He will go and he will rally his troops to come and try to destroy the church, to try to snuff out the light of the church. And so in verse 8, that's what it tells us, that he's going to go and deceive the nations that are in the four quarters of the earth. Now, John, again, is not transported in, into the future here. He's seeing a vision. And so the picture here is not some obscure nation in the final hours of earth history. Gog and Magog comes from Ezekiel 38. And it's a reference to uh, Gog is the king of Magog, and it's a reference to the enemies of, of God's people. Uh, he's not trying to give us some cryptic message that we need to decode. Rather, Magog is the nations, and he so much as tells us that point blank in verse 8. And Satan will go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. So he's telling us that those are the nations. And so number two, Gog and Magog represent the nations of the earth who follow Satan in attacking the church. And they outnumber the sand of the sea. The devil deceives them. Now we know in the final hours of the earth there will be this strong delusion that will fill the minds of the wicked. In fact, uh, if, you, if you want to, you can turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. <clears throat> And I'll show you, Paul tells us exactly the same thing that, that John is telling us here, only Paul tells us more straightforward, not in a picture form. And if you listen, Paul here, he's going to tell us plainly how these things play out. And what Paul says in that passage, 
refers to the vision that John writes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And some of this will be familiar to you when you hear it. Paul says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon for soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin, that is the Antichrist, be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sitteth, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, that is the church, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know with what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then, here's the part that connects to what we're talking about. And then shall the wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of the mouth and shall destroy them with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all powers and signs and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness to them that perish. But they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. In other words, Paul essentially is saying that in the last days that Satan will raise up a man who will lead a multitude away. And that person will set himself up in the church as if he is Christ. He is Antichrist. And he will lead a great falling away of professing Christians. Obviously, they're not true Christians because Jesus tells us that those who believe are going to persevere to the end. But, but Satan leads astray those who are just religious, those who would say, Jesus is Lord, Lord, but not do the things in which he says, right? Many within the church. But he uses this phrase in verse 11, for we hear that there are some which... Sorry, wrong verse. Verse 11... And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. It is God that sends the strong delusion. It's not that God is lying to them. It's that God sends Satan or allows Satan to go and deceive these people. And he turns them over to that deceived mind so that they will not believe, so that they will not listen. And so number three in your notes, Satan's plan to deceive the nations will ultimately be used by God to fulfill his purposes. It's ultimately going to be used by God. It's God who sends the strong delusion. God does it through the devil. And God removes from them any restraint of sin. And the restraining power that God gives, His common grace that He gives to all men right now, will be taken away. Satan will be allowed to lead them into full delusion, into full deception. There will be no restraint from God on it. In fact, Jesus tells us in Matthew 24... That in those last days, that the days will be cut short for the sake of the elect, because even they might be deceived if the days carried on too long. That's how strong of a delusion and a deception Satan is going to be allowed to bring to the nations. And that's what John is telling us in Revelation 20, that Satan is going to be unloosed and he's going to deceive the nations and lead them in to attack the church. This guy that you were talking about in Second Thessalonians, is that the Antichrist? Yes. So the Antichrist is a man. Yes. Human. Yes. And so the, the point that I want to make from this is this is why it's, it's absolutely essential that we know what we believe, that we know why we believe what we believe, that we stand on strong doctrine, that, that our church has a statement of faith that it, it holds to, that it knows because Satan is going to bring a strong delusion, a, a deception, and people will fall away if we don't know what we believe and where we stand. And this is a terrifying warning from God, because there will be churches and denominations that will be carried away. In fact, this is already happening in a lot of the world. Could the, the, bound, the, the bond of Satan's restraint already be loosening? Right? Mainline Protestant churches, those churches that 200 years ago were the main denominations within America have already abandoned the faith. In our context, it's not so dark yet. We're in the Bible Belt. But if you go to places like New England, for example, it is extremely dark. They are in desperate need for godly pastors to preach the Word. New England used to be what we would call the Bible Belt 200 years ago. And now they're full of mainline churches that 
ordain transgender homosexual pastors. They, they have completely abandoned the faith. They deny the inerrancy of Scripture. They deny that Jesus is the only means of salvation. They, they deny the, the core essentials of the faith. They, they are completely apostate. And they've, they've bought into the lie of, this, of, of the devil. So, so could his chains already be loosening? And this is why we must know what we believe and why we believe it. Or we too will be led away. Now someone may ask, I thought the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The gates of hell won't prevail, right? So how, how does this happen? Well, the church will succeed. The church will be victorious. Our mission will be accomplished. Gates, though, are meant to keep people out. And Jesus is telling us that the church cannot be stopped from invading the kingdom of darkness. But we are also warned that churches fall from the inside. That there are enemies within. They're called wolves. And they come in and they destroy the sheep. And the way that wolves work and the way that they do that is because the pastor or the elders, the pastors, are not doing their duty to teach the people sound doctrine and to ward off the wolves. That's part of what a shepherd does, right? He fights the, the wolves. But another thing is, is that the churches have, have broadened the pasture in which they're in. They don't have good fences anymore. They don't have the, the good doctrine there to keep them in. And so the wolves are able to get in easily and destroy the sheep. And so we need to know what we believe. We need to stand on the truth. May we be a church that seeks to know the truth and live the truth that the devil and his wolves can't tear us apart, that we will not fall victim to his tricks. The next part is we see the defeated devil. In verse 9, those people that the devil deceived, they went up on the breadth of the earth, and they compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And so the picture we get here is these, these, you have the devil released and he runs around the globe and he's deceiving the nations and the governments and they all band together to come and destroy the saints. And in John's vision, he sees them all surround the people of God and he's ready to attack and destroy. And as soon as they go to implement their plan to destroy the church, fire comes down from heaven from God and destroys them. And so number four, warfare is used as an image for the persecution of the church. And that's what ultimately the picture is here. The idea is not that there's going to be tanks and, uh, I mean, I guess they could use tanks to persecute the church, but the, the idea is not necessarily like modern warfare fighting and the church has to take up arms to try to fight back in a, in a militant sense. The idea that John is giving us here is that a picture of persecution, that Satan is going to deceive the nations of the world in one by one, they're going to turn on Christianity. They're going to turn on the church and begin putting Christians in prison, beheading them, killing them. That's the idea. And I get that from other parts of Scripture where it talks about the last days. I would like to point out that the persecution of the church at the hands of the devil will be done through the state. It will be done through governments. It's a state-sponsored persecution. And this is one of the reasons why we should be beware of marrying the church and the state. A separation of the government-controlled church is what is best. And a clear separation between the church and government is necessary. I mean, do you really want a government teaching your children about God? Do you want our government teaching them about who Jesus is? Do you want the woke transgender mobs telling your children how to be saved? The transgender one. Uh, I don't know what I said. The transgender mob, maybe? The, the mob? Oh, mob. I'm sorry. I guess, yeah. <laughs> I thought you said the transgender mob. No. <laughs> them too. Do, do you want the, the corrupt politicians to control church property and church funds? Right? We, we, we need that separation. And we should, however, we should pray for God fearing men to be raised up to lead our country, right? We should pray for them to, to do things through the wisdom of Scripture and their lawmaking. They should use God's wisdom, right? That's what we want, but we don't want to marry the church and the state. That has never ended well in history for the church. And what we're seeing in Revelation, we've seen this earlier in Revelation, it will happen again. The Antichrist is, is going to be a religious figure who marries the church and the state. That's what's going to happen. Yeah, you see elements of it because, because Satan has a plan. He's just restrained from implementing it fully, right? 
And once those restraints are gone, you're going to see that globally. And that's, that's why we have to beware. That's, that's what we're seeing play out. And we see it in small pockets now. But one day it'll be global. That's uh, just, just when things seem at worst, like the church is going to be destroyed by the nations, that's when Christ will return. That's when fire will come down from heaven and devour them. That's a picture of the return of Christ. Because in 2 Thessalonians 2.8, I just read this to you. It says, um, the wicked, uh, the Lord shall consume the wicked with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy them with the brightness of his coming. It's the return of the Lord, right? The day of the Lord is judgment from God on, on that wickedness. It's the same moment that the dead in Christ will rise, that we will be glorified and given a, a new body. His return will not only rescue the church from the state of persecution, it will glorify us. It will usher in the eternal state. And if you notice in verse 9, the church is described with two pictures. The church is a camp of the saints, and it's the beloved city. And that's number 5. The, the church is seen as both a camp and a beloved city, or the beloved city. And this reminds us of two great truths. That the church is a, is a camp of saints. We are a people who have not yet arrived at our final destination, the city of Jerusalem. That we are living in enemy territory. We're like a camp of paratroopers behind enemy lines. And we're doing everything we can to rescue one more prisoner of war from the clutches of Satan. Right? That's the church mentality. And we must beware that we don't take a defeated mindset. That the gospel ministry is ineffective. That what we are doing doesn't matter because that's not true. It may be difficult, but the gospel will prevail. The second picture is the church is the beloved city. We're the bride of Christ. And we're going to see this more in the, in the next chapter. But we've already been delivered from the clutches of Satan. We already have eternal life. But that shouldn't lull us to sleep. We should stay on task and stay on mission. We must be vigilant and busy about the kingdom work. And so letter A, the church should not cower in fear and live defeated. Nor should the church rest from labor as though there is no mission. So we shouldn't live in fear that Satan's going to destroy us and that this persecution is coming. Nor should we be lazy as if there's no mission. And a great truth in this is that all those for whom Jesus died will be saved. All of the elect will be redeemed. This last hour war campaign of the devil will not stop the gospel. It ultimately will not hinder the kingdom of God, even though he brings the nations against him. Ultimately, in the words of Acts 13, 48, all who were ordained to eternal life will believe and be saved. Why is that? Because of what Peter tells us. When the world mocks us, because it's been 2,000 years since Jesus returned, that's what Peter says in 2 Peter 3, we know that God will keep His word, right? 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. Some count it as slackness, but it is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This very verse is telling us that God is not willing that any of His elect, any of those whom He ordained to eternal life would, be, would perish. See, the idea in 2 Peter 3, 9, that God is not willing that any should perish, doesn't mean that God is not willing for any person who has ever lived to not perish. Because if God willed that, then that's what would happen. Rather, the verse is promising that God's people, those who are ordained unto salvation, that they will not perish. You see, the context, the context of the word any makes a difference. If I invited you over to my house and I said, eat anything you like, and you started eating my kitchen table, I'd probably run you out of my house, right? Obviously, there's a context to the word anything, right? You can't just eat anything and start taking pictures off my walls and eating my pictures, right? It's in the context of food. And in the same way, 2 Peter 3 there's a context to the word any. Peter, in verse 8, says, he's talking to his beloved, to the church. And he says, God is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish. So who is the any? Us, the beloved, the church, those whom were ordained to eternal life. That's what Peter is saying. I, I say all of that because the hope of 2 Peter 3 is that while the world rages around us against the gospel and against the church... 
Peter says, do not fear because God is being patient, awaiting for all of those ordained to eternal life to repent and to be saved. Not one will fail. Jesus will not lose one sheep that the Father gave him. They will all be saved. And so we should continue on in the mission because it will prevail. The gospel will win the day. Christ is mighty and He is capable. And He saves those for whom He died. And then in verse 10, ultimately the devil is defeated. He's cast into the lake of fire along with the beast and the false prophet. The devil is not and will not be in charge of hell. He will be a sufferer in hell with countless billions who die in their sin. As we'll see in the the last part. I want to give you really quick a description here of the lake of fire from verse 10. Letter A under... Number six, it is a place of suffering and anguish. I think we have that picture in our minds already of hell. We, we understand hell is a place of suffering and anguish. But letter B, it is permanent, not temporary. It is permanent. The Bible explicitly tells us that hell is eternal. Not only does the Bible show us that it's eternal, but that the person who's not born again, that person hates God, and they're going to still hate God through all eternity. That's what... The idea of them gnashing their teeth is. Gnashing your teeth in the Bible is anger. Being angry at someone. And so they're going to be angry at God for all of eternity. Not only does the Bible explicitly tell us that hell is eternal and that men are going to eternally sin, but the human soul is created to not die. The human soul is created with eternity. Ecclesiastes says God has put eternity into the hearts of men. So men will live forever. The question is where? And even the wicked will be raised from the grave and their souls united to a physical body. And then they will die for all of eternity. And so let us see. It is a physical place, not a spiritual realm. The lake of fire ultimately will be physical. Hell right now is where wicked souls go. But one day there will be a resurrection even of the wicked. And they will be cast physically into the lake of fire. And then letter D. It is a place of judgment. Not a neutral site. Hell is not simply a place that God puts people that's just a little further away from His goodness. It's not a place that God sends people like a time out. It's not a prison where you can have a comfortable bed and a TV. It's a place of judgment. A place described in the Bible as unceasing torture. A place of wailing and eternal flame. Someone may say, but that sounds too harsh. How could a loving God send people to a place like that? To which the Bible would answer you, You don't understand the heinousness of sin. You don't understand how wicked sin actually is. And God is love. And precisely because God is love, He will punish wickedness. And He will punish wicked men because God loves righteousness and goodness and truth. And because God is love, He will punish sinners in hell. The lake of fire was originally made for the devil and for his demons. But those who follow Satan, who live according to Satan's way and not God's way, they're going to face the same destination that the devil will face. The lake of fire. And then we see the last four verses, or five verses, is the day of judgment. First we see the place of judgment, which is before the throne, the great white throne in verse 11. I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And so number seven, the judgment of the wicked will be carried out by the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is this one who is on the great white throne. Jesus is the one. I forgot to give you guys a blank on that one, didn't I? John chapter 5 says, Jesus says, For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men might honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. Every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, and He is King of kings. So terrifying will that day be that even the heavens and the earth will flee from before His face. The entire creation will rupture and disintegrate. As Peter says in 2 Peter 3, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. It will flee away from the face of Christ. It will be a terrifying thing for the unrepentant sinner to endure standing before the one of whom even creation recognizes as the Holy One and flees from His presence. Those sinners will stand and face trial, answering for their evil deeds, their hatred. And we see, in verse 12, we see the people of judgment. The judgment here is for the wicked. 
Those who are in Christ have already passed from the judgment. In fact, for God to judge a Christian at the great white throne according to his works would be unjust because our works have already been judged. By faith, they were judged in Christ on the cross. And so our judgment is already passed. We've already passed through judgment. Christ took that judgment. And so this judgment, and this is number eight, this judgment will be for the wicked. The final judgment will be just, impartial, and righteous. Because they will stand before this great white throne and they will answer for their works. The rich and the poor, the great and the small, no one will get off. There will be no hiring of a good lawyer, right? The rich will not have the privilege of getting a good lawyer to get them off. He will judge justly and impartially. He will judge righteously. He knows all, he sees all, and everything will be laid exposed before him. The arrogant and the angry, the hateful and the harlot, all will fall down on their face before the king of all the earth. The mighty men, the rich men, all will bow and they will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then we see the scope of the judgment in verse 13. The sea gave up their dead, death and hell delivered up its dead, and they were all judged according to their works. And so number nine, no sinner will escape from the judgment, but all will stand before the throne. No sinner will escape. They will all be cast into the lake of fire. Their names who are not written in the book of life, they are judged for their works. What a terrifying thing to be judged for your works. Your evil works can never justify you. They can never be good enough before God. As Isaiah says, your own works, your, your, your best deeds are as filthy rags. And then we see the conclusion of the judgment in the last two verses. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And so number 10, all sinners who are judged will be thrown into the lake of fire for all eternity. If you stand before the great white throne, it's over. Your only hope is to not stand in that judgment because no one will walk away from it. All are guilty before him. Your only hope is to bow before him now, to confess him as Lord now. To trust in His resurrection and His payment for sin. And for you, who are saints, who are already believers, rejoice in God's justice and in His mercy, that in Christ you are forgiven, because Christ took the judgment. So don't hear this passage and think, we win, that's all. Let this compel you onward to share the gospel, to proclaim the truth. And listen to Peter's words in 2 Peter 3. I read to you parts of this chapter. But this is Peter's conclusion to the whole earth being destroyed in judgment day. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conversation or holy living and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of Him in peace without spot, and blameless. And that sets us up for chapter 21, when the new heaven and the new earth will come, and the new Jerusalem will come down from heaven. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your precious promises that you give us in your word. Lord, for these, these great truths that encourage our hearts and give us hope. I pray, Father, that you, will, um, that you will give us strength to endure, even as the world around us rages against us. Lord, that as the devil comes against us, we pray, Lord, for strength. We know that we can only get that from you. Lord, help us to stand firmly on the gospel. Lord, help us to not be deceived and to fall into delusion, but to stand firm. Lord, help us to continue to share the gospel. Lord, help us to, to, to be bold in our witness for you. Lord, help us to have that confidence to know that, that all of those whom you ordained to eternal life will be saved, and that we are the means by which you use to go and preach that gospel and to save those people. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us with that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.